It's okay to be a work in progress all the time. Nobody has it figured out. Nasty gal, it was a blast. It was the most fun ride. From 22 years old, starting that thing, that first eight years was like the best. So in 2016, you end up on the cover of Forbes' Richest Self-Made Women, and you were richer than Beyonce. How did that feel? Totally weird. So that's like early summer of 2016. By November of 2016, Nasty Gal had fallen apart. I'm Sophia Amoruso, founder of Nasty Gal. One of Forbes' richest self-made women. She is a serial entrepreneur, content creator. She's also a best-selling author of a book called Girl Boss. Now she is raising her first fund called Trust Fund. What do you think is the fastest way to $100,000? So I think the fastest way to $100,000 right now I'm Erica Kohlberg, and you're listening to the Erica Taught Me podcast. So did you always want to become an entrepreneur? No, I didn't even realize I was ambitious. I think I was just really like, I don't know, anxious and didn't really like the rules, which you hear about entrepreneurs, but I didn't think that meant ambitious. I thought it meant loser. And then I figured out along the way that it meant that I actually just didn't like working for other people and was better at working for myself. Because you never had the traditional job, right? You went straight to your own company. Yeah, I mean, straight to anything I think is tough for me to say in my life. But I went from, yeah, high school. I was homeschooling in high school. I got my diploma in the mail. I didn't I didn't like it. I didn't want to go. Moved out when I was 17. And then it was just like a litany of shitty jobs. It was like shoe stores and bookstores, which is not that shitty record stores. Still fun. Photo labs, still fun. But dry cleaners, you know, all kind of like sub. my first job was at Subway Sandwiches. So in terms of went straight there being the first kind of legitimate job I had that wasn't checking it, student IDs in the lobby of an art school, which was my last job. Um, anything that had any relation to leadership. Yeah. Nasty gal was the first thing, but I'd never had an example of it because the leadership I had experienced was you forgot to clock out today. And like you were late from your lunch break. So that was the example I had when I started a business that I didn't really realize was going to end up being something where I was going to be a leader of way too many people. <laughs> <laughs> because Nasty Gal started off just because of your hobby of liking vintage clothing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I wore vintage clothing. I love vintage clothing. Part of it was because it was cheap but mostly just because I like I listen to old music I like old movies I don't know I'm just kind of like a baby boomer or something I guess I'm I am wearing vintage I'm wearing some vintage today and just saw like wow other people are selling these clothes on eBay for so much more than I know I can find them for I didn't know that people were paying this much for the same stuff that I was wearing or buying and so I thought okay like let me give it a shot so what was the first sale? Do you remember how much money you made? How much of a profit? The first things I put on eBay were, didn't do well. So the first things I put on eBay, I was like, oh, people will like my taste and my things. And so I put stuff that was were mine on there that I like didn't want anymore, which a lot of people do. But that's nice. That's resale. That's unloading some of your clothes, but it's not building a brand. It's not getting to know your customer. It's not figuring out what the market is and what people are really looking for. And sometimes that doesn't necessarily like pair itself up with the wardrobe that you're trying to get rid of. So the first stuff I sold didn't really sell very well. You know, when you start the auction at $9.99 and you may have paid more than $9.99 for some of these things. And often after 10 days, like some of them don't even sell for, for $10. So then I went and started looking at what other people were selling and what they were doing well. And I, the first thing I sold, I don't remember the first piece of vintage I sold, but I remember it being a lot more than I anticipated. And I remember specifically an early one that was this Lily Ann 19 like 60s very thick like wool kind of like shift dress with like a fur collar and like full fur or like like cuffs and just being like I don't know who wears this it's very kind of grandma-y but <laughs> like it's a great brand and it's really well made and I guess this is what people want and just kept refining it from there. 
Then what was that first moment? I think every entrepreneur has this, like the first money moment where you are just so excited you can never forget. So mine was, I remember I started my legal company and I sold these legal documents to a complete stranger for $300 or $400. And it was like I had won the lottery. Like I remember going around my apartment, like screaming, jumping up and down. I know you have that moment. What was that for you? It was a Chanel jacket. So I used to like, sit at like we'll stand at like the Goodwill and Salvation Army and the thrift stores and just wait for these women to bring shop like they were like grocery store shopping carts full of clothes that they had put on the hangers out and they were then kind of placing in different parts of the store but it was like the first stuff uh the first time like anyone would have seen it um so I like camped out it was pretty weird and one one time they pushed it out and when they like went to put some of it away, I would go flip through everything and see like what there was before they went and like distributed it out throughout the store. And I was like, flip, flip, flip. And it was like a Chanel jacket. And then it was like uh, another Chanel jacket. And they were both $8. And I put one of them on eBay for $9.99 starting auction price. And it sold for over a thousand. And I remember just being like, this is crazy. I mean, that's a, that's oh a great gosh. profit, right? Like that's insane. And I was paying five hundred dollars a month rent, and like didn't have a kitchen, and it was like you know subsisting on Boston Market and Starbucks, and had a hot plate, and like did my dishes in the sink. And I was like, <laughs> I'm rich. You felt rich in that moment. Yeah, I was like, I'm <laughs> onto something. So how does it then progress to become this company where you have hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue? Like, what happens along the line to get you there? Yeah, definitely not overnight. But it happened pretty quickly. So year one on eBay, I did $75,000 in revenue, which was, I think, twice what I had ever made in a year. But that's like spotted employment, right? That's not even full-time gainful employment. Yeah. I was not good at that. Year two was 250000 Year three was $1.1 million. Year four was six and a half. Year five was twelve. And then it was on a 12, kind of an upswing from 12 to 28, where venture capitalists came in and gave the company $60 million and valued it at $350 million. But I guess kind of going back to like, that would be very hard to do with just an eBay store. So Mm -hmm. it started with eBay. It started with vintage clothing. But after about a year, I was like, maybe I'll launch my own website. Like um, people love this. The brand is like, people are obsessed, I'm really good at picking things. And eBay keeps like slapping me on the wrist for like linking out to my MySpace profile from the, <laughs> from the auction page. And I, you know, they're promoting other people's stuff like under my listing. Like, why would I, why would I work so hard to build a customer base and then have my competitor like, you know, listed directly under my listing. So it was like, whatever, I'm going to build a website. And so I actually left eBay And I launched nastygalvintage.com with like 150 pieces and it sold out overnight. And it was like, because at auction, you have 10 days, like inventory that sits there just kind of has to sit there. But this you could just buy and it was gone. And I was like, I got really sick. I was working around the clock and eventually hired my my first employee. But I remember Kelly Ripa's stylist calling from L.A. And I'm like, at this point, I'm in Benicia. Do you know where this is? At this point, I'm like way out in the East Bay. I'm like way far from San Francisco and all my friends in this like weird old shipyard in this space that's now not my apartment, but like, and it feels fancy, but it's just this like drafty old like building in like an old shipyard. And I didn't know, like, I didn't care about fashion really. I liked style and like Hollywood was definitely not my goal. Um, but I just remember like Kelly Ripa's stylist called and was like, do you have another extra small in that vintage jacket? And I was like, no, there's one. You're a stylist. You should. I didn't say it like that. I don't even remember. <laughs> it was probably an email, but I just remember being like, oh, my God, I'm on Hollywood's radar. This is crazy. Is that even a real thing? Um, yeah, it's just and it was just so exciting. So what scaled the company was not just selling vintage I started going to trade shows, Mm -hmm. curating different brands based on what I had learned early on from what it is my customers wanted, what I sold them as vintage. And that was just kind of a great test. You know, entrepreneurs are, you know, often want to just go start the big thing and buy a bunch of inventory and say, like, this is what the brand is or this is what my customer wants. But vintage gave me such a great opportunity to 
like start small and iterate and sell one thing at a time and get a really great kind of qualitative understanding of what it was that my customer wanted. Because I guess with vintage, there would always be an inventory issue where there are not two jackets there. Yeah, no, it's like it's a lot of work to sell one thing. And if you're the only person working for that company and, you know, you buy it for eight dollars and sell it for even 80, that's great. But, you know, similar to a service business, if you want to do more of that, it's you're replicating, shooting it, you know, steaming it, styling it, shooting it, describing it, weighing it right? Like uploading all that stuff to eBay or a website. And so what buying new stuff allowed me to do is have depth. So I could take one photo and write one description and weigh that thing and have 10 things to sell. Even though I wasn't selling it for 10 times more than I paid for it, I could do that with so many things and with so much depth eventually that it just scaled beyond what I had really anticipated. So at this point, there were basically like two pivotal decisions that you made. The first was leaving eBay, which is scary in and of itself, because up until then you had all of your money was made from eBay and you decided to just cut them off and completely launch your own website. And then the second was going from only vintage to selling essentially curated pieces that you were picking up based on what the vintage world wanted. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, eBay was just yeah a place where I felt like eventually was limiting like nasty gal at that point was very much a brand even though it was on another platform people were obsessed and when i launched the website do you know who it where is um so they like they were an early similar to like daily candy and they're still around i was just with Catherine power their founder who founded merit which is a beauty brand versed which is a skincare brand she's a wine brand called Aveline with Cameron Diaz she's done a bunch of stuff since then but they were like a fashion kind of newsletter at the time and they did a dedicated email because they were so stoked about Nasty Gal launching a website Daily Candy which was another huge one which would be like the Zoe report or bustle or something like that now Um, but there were so fewer and people were so obsessed with even those few places where you could get like fashion news and updates and trends and both of them covered nasty gals launch i didn't pitch it i didn't have a publicist i didn't i didn't know what editors were i didn't but they were just so obsessed that they talk about it and so it was just clear kind of going into leaving ebay that there was like maybe an opportunity to knock that out of the park. So when those emails went out, was there an immediate boost in traffic to the website? The whole thing just like sold out. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And you see this with creators now. It's like that was editorial, magazines, the media, you know, once had and still does have an influence on sales, but not in the way that people do. Um, So you're seeing like Mr. Beast or I'm, you know, Creators have these product drops in the same way with this influence and credibility because they've got some insider knowledge or taste on something that used to be reserved for the people who got invited to Fashion Week. Then the bloggers happen. Now it's creators. And it's that kind of influence that can sell something out entirely. And it's just really fascinating to watch how that's progressed from the time that Daily Candy and Who We're talked about Nasty Gal to the time where bloggers were talking about Nasty Gal to now, you know, creators talking about whatever. What were some of the roadblocks that you did not expect in those first stages of having that website? I didn't expect to have to keep up with that amount of inventory and customers. I just remember getting really, really burned out. And I remember hiring my first employee and being like, okay, delegation, never managed anybody before. And so, you know, was feeling my way in around in the dark with that. And managing people is like a little bit easier than like leadership. And I didn't really have to think about leadership until later, which I should have much earlier. But thinking, okay, what are the as- things that are not essential for me to do? And of course, as an entrepreneur, it's easy for you to think that everything that you've done when you were the first person to do it all, your fingerprint and signatures on everything, whether it's slapping a label on a box or how you write a thank you or craft a customer service email is the thing that makes it successful. That's probably not the case. And there are definitely things that you can delegate and it's totally scary. But being able to do that and giving yourself so much more time back to do the things that you're really great at is what, you know, that's like management leadership 101. And so hired my first employee. She did customer service. I trained her on my voice. Like I remember she said, 
sparkly once and I was like, it's glitter or something <laughs> and like being like, this is important kind of stuff. And, you know, she shipped, she steamed stuff because I steamed everything up until that point. And there were things that I missed. Like I kind of like steaming stuff, but I styled and I did the photography and I edited the photos and I wrote like I, she eventually wrote product descriptions. But that was like I was like, this is my voice. Like, this is why it's successful. I didn't I don't think I said things like that. But again, it's easy to be yeah. so attached to your talent that you don't even know which of those things is actually the thing that people are following you for. I can completely relate. Delegating is the hardest thing for me because I'm such a perfectionist. And I do have that mindset that, oh, I'm going to do things 100% correctly. But someone was telling me like, you have to accept as you're growing that even if someone else can do it 80% of the way that you would do it personally, that's much better than working around the clock and burning yourself out and not being able to grow the sustainable business, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out. But yeah. I am too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, who was your second employee that you hired? Um, I think the second employee was someone to ship stuff. There was, we had an intern named Nick Rivera, who's very special. And so he did a lot of different things like inventory and like helped with styling. I mean, inventory was sitting on a floor, like opening plastic bags and like counting the number of smalls and putting them in like a cardboard box, you know, like that were teetering on one another. You know, it was <laughs> like, it wasn't a warehouse. Right. And then there was a shipping guy. I remember I hired and he didn't last very long. It, we shipped things from a PC because the printer device that printed the labels was like not compatible with like a Mac at that time or something. I don't know why. And I remember him being at this point, we were in a retail storefront next to a piano store in Berkeley and but like not ever open. It was just a retail storefront. And him, he like yelled up into the loft. It says Norton antivirus. What do I click? And I was like, oh, my God, you click the X. <laughs> like, I can't train. I cannot train for this. And then I think another day he was like, I have to leave early. It's grocery day. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Like, so it didn't it didn't quite work out. Yeah, <laughs> I can understand why. <laughs> Did you have any mentors at the time or other entrepreneur friends who were kind of giving you advice and guiding you in any sense? I had no entrepreneur friends. Like I didn't, I don't even know if I knew that, like that wasn't my goal. I was de facto CEO. I didn't really want to be, I wanted to be like the cool boss because I didn't really want to be a business person. So that's a whole nother kind of story about culture. But I did have a consultant early on and I went online and I like did some digging. Okay, fashion, LA fashion market. Uh, is there like some organization or whatever? And there's some called like Fashion Business Inc. Honestly, I don't know if that's even what it's called. But I just called some office in downtown LA and I was like, hi, are there any consultants that like help with fashion stuff? Do you know anybody? And they were like, yeah. And they gave me a couple people's names and I called one. And this guy was just like really hardcore, real straight shooter. His name's Dana Freed. I've referred him to a lot of the founders that I've invested in and met along the way. He was like a former CFO, COO at a big footwear brand. And he helped me put together the first financials and gave me an employee handbook that he had put together with some other company that probably cost them 50 grand. And I just like... <laughs> changed the name to nasty gal and stuff in it. I was like, wow, this is this guy's worth his weight in gold. And he was, yeah, he was amazing. And he was kind of my outsource, like CFO, COO until I hired my first executives. At what point did you hire your first executive? Where in that journey were you? Yeah, that was probably like 2010 is my guess. We were now in a warehouse in Emeryville, also in the East Bay, uh, 7,000 square feet, which was cool because I was like, whoa, we can like I don't even skateboard, but I was like, this is like a, you know, young person's dream is to just have this warehouse to do whatever you want. in. yeah, we had filled that up and there was I put I don't know if I put out a job description or he reached out to me directly. Um, his name was Frank and he had done operations in some e-com businesses and hired him. And I think he lasted like a year, year and a half. And I moved the company to L.A. and he didn't really want to make the move. So. Ended up with a different COO after that. But he was great. He was very special. He was the first person who was like, okay, we're going to get an accountant. We're going to get an HR person. And I was like, I don't, never worked with those people. I don't even think I'd worked in a business that had HR. You know, I'd worked in such small yeah. businesses, even as an hourly employee that like, I was like, I don't, okay. 
benefits. <laughs> Were you still enjoying it? Like it, looking back, was there a point where you really enjoyed it and then things switched off or? I enjoyed it up until the last like year and a half. It was a blast. It was the most fun ride from 22 years old, starting that thing to whatever. I think I left when I was 32. So like that first eight years was like the best, like the best, you know, and I've had so much fun in my 30s as well. Less like related to Nasty Gal, whether it's in my personal life or whatever with travel and other things that I've done. But like, you know, it was such a rocket ship and we were, you know, clinking champagne glasses for some milestone at any given time. And there was a time where people would walk up to me and congratulate me. And I or I'd see people I knew and they'd congratulate me and I'd have to ask for which thing like <laughs> there was so much going on. It was just, you know, and it was distracting. It was like blinding. It was exciting. It was so fun to take a whole team on that ride and then, you know, to take my friends on the ride and to take my friends on vacations and take my mom on vacation. And just the whole travel the world and speak at different things. And, you know, then there was the book and that was part of that huge crescendo. And the book was in. 2014, which was about, I guess, seven years into the business. So in 2016, you end up on the cover of Forbes' Richest Self-Made Women, and you were richer than Beyonce. Taylor Swift was the only one who was younger than you. So you were the second youngest woman on this list. How did that feel? Totally weird. Um, I was maybe richer than Beyonce on paper by nature of the fact that investors had said my company was worth $350 million and I owned 80% of it, right? So that's, two, I honestly not good at math, but I guess that's $280 million. And I never called Forbes and said, like, let me show you, you know, my bank account or whatever. But on paper, like, that's my company, whatever, had been valued at $350 million. And so I was like, cool, whatever. <laughs> like I've done layoffs and stuff and this thing's like teetering because this is 2016 now. It's two years after the book came out and they're like, we want to put you on the cover. And I was like, this will be really funny looking back later in my life. I hope I pull this company off. And if I don't, then I still get to look at that and like laugh or something. You know, it's just <laughs> like a trip. I think I've said yes to things sometimes uh, like a little like like cavalier dangerous like that I that I could be more careful. But I'm also like what's the worst that could happen? If anything, even if it hurts now, it'll be funny <laughs> or entertaining <laughs> or a good story or good IP or a great book or whatever later. So yes, the cover of Forbes happened in I think June of 2016, maybe. So here's, let me just paint you a picture of uh, 2016, you know, spring of 2016 to spring of 2017. So in the summer of 17, I'm on the cover of Forbes magazine and they called me one of America's richest self-made women. And then a month later, my husband of like a year, we'd been together for like four years. He was like, I want out. And I was like, what? Like, we don't even argue. What? I don't get it. This is so, I was shocked. I was shocked. So being with someone who maybe is not a good communicator about their emotions to the point where that that's like a, a whiplash, probably better to know sooner rather than later. Yeah. But that was really, really, really tough. So that's like early summer of 2016. By November of 2016, Nasty Gal had fallen apart. So it had been years in the making. I wasn't the CEO for the last two years. I was really involved in the creative stuff. I also had written a book and gone on a victory lap and was traveling all over the world. But in November of that year, we filed for Chapter 11, which was really, really hard after 10 years of building the business. And I don't want to like just blow by that or any of those things, but just for the sake of telling this 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 story cr chronologically, is uh, in April of 2017, a Netflix series comes out about my life, called Girl Boss, with a girl named Sophia, building building a company called Nasty Gal, produced by Charlize Theron, very cool, in and it's streamed into 130 million homes in 195 countries in almost every language four months after I've left the company that I had built for the last 10 years, my entire youth was no longer associated with trying to move on. And now there's this massive PR campaign about the person I was 10 years earlier and this whole new wave of like awareness of this girl doing this thing called Nasty Gal, 
which was just and on top of like, you know, the press, of course, coming out about like, I'm a failure, I'm not a girl boss, I built a crappy culture. I mean, I got really far given the experience I had, I think, <laughs> honestly, like it's sold for 20 million even in chapter 11. So like, I didn't make any money on that, but at least like, hey, like I still built something in my 20s that sold for $20 million. Like if that's a failure, then I'll take it. That's a roller coaster in Such that a roller coaster. year and a half. How did you deal with it? First with your husband and then the chapter 11 bankruptcy and then the Netflix show coming out. How did I deal with it? I mean, I was just kind of in the thick of it. When you're in the thick of it, you know, it's like you're just trying to stay out of the quicksand and deal with like every blow emotionally as it comes and remind yourself that people saying things about you who don't know you don't have the full story. Um, it's also an opportunity to learn because where there's smoke, there's usually fire. And I'm not someone who thinks that I did a perfect job and everybody's wrong. Like that's those people are insane. I fell in love. So that helped. That was distracting. And I still had a great life. Like part of my life was falling apart, but it was something I had like really struggled with for the last few years and in some ways was ready to be over. I didn't know how to turn a company around at that stage. I had hired a CEO and I had a team of really seasoned executives. And at that point, I, had, I hadn't thrown up my hands, but I really was at a loss with what to do with the business. So I was able to focus on other things and be like, all right, like I signed up for a lot. I really tried to keep my promise. I did the best I could. I hired amazing people. We've had a great ride. We've all learned so much. But also, this is still my life, and I can't be indebted to this thing forever. Like, it's still, it's it's like time is passing, and I'm going to wake up every day and be like, okay, is this the thing that I really want? I think that's something that's interesting about success is that, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier, once something's successful, you're kind of crazy to let it go. And you don't know what comes with it. And that's why I'm really careful now about what I sign up for. Because when it's successful, it's not like, wow, yay, I work for myself. I'm an entrepreneur. It's like when it's successful, it's like, oh, I have to hire people and I have to lead them and I have to create processes and I have to think about culture and people need training and they want promotions and I have to think about benefits. And like now I'm in this thing and do I even like fashion? You know, like I didn't even mean to be in fashion, but I'm not complaining, right? But the day to day of a job, when you pursue your dreams or your passion or, you know, connect your talent to, I guess, a marketplace like eBay, what that can become is incredible. But the day to day of that job is often not what it is that you thought it would be when you started doing that. So when Nasty Gal ended, it wasn't the worst because it was the first time in my life where I was maybe able to kind of reinvent myself and think about what it was that I really wanted. And I also had this amazing thing called Girl Boss that came on off the back of the book and the podcast. I had a podcast for five years called Girl Boss Radio. And there was just this amazing, inspired community of women that even when the shit hit the fan for me in 2016, 2017, they all showed up. And the permission I gave them, and I hate saying I did anything for anybody, but what I've been told is that, you know, as Girl Boss was the book that came out a year after Lean In. And it was the only other example of an entrepreneurial woman, non executive, though, you know, with a business in the business book section, maybe Susie Orman, financial lady, right? I didn't have the pedigree. I'm a community college dropout, blah, blah, blah. Very cute story. But it inspired like every girl with a Shopify, you know, a trial account of Calendly or who wants to create a lash business or a brow business or is a graphic designer at an agency, but maybe wants to go out on her own and doesn't think she's a business person. That book like showed a whole generation of women that they could just like go do that without that perfect pedigree or without a business background. And it still continues to do that work. So I know what Girl Boss did. And then when I face planted, you know, it had been years after the book. It would have been like four years. And the girls who I probably inspired to go like chase their dreams had probably also face planted <laughs> or were about to. And in some ways, I think watching that was probably really refreshing and humanizing to be like, oh, even the girl boss doesn't pull it off. And it's like, yeah, no, 
nobody pulls it off. Nobody, nothing lasts forever. Nobody pulls it off forever. Some people do, but it always comes with huge snags. So happy to share. No, and I think I remember maybe it was 2015 that my friend was like, you have to see this lady. She's amazing. Like she's building her, been building her own company. And I was in law school at the time and I didn't know the word entrepreneur really. Like I knew that when I started things on my own, I enjoyed that, but I wasn't able to pinpoint that to this word entrepreneur. But I remember just seeing your success and being like, wow, this is incredible. But I think what I appreciate the most is just how you are vulnerable about both sides of it. Because with everything in life, if you only see people's successes, then if you have a little hiccup in the road, you feel like you're very alone in that and you're the only one who messed up and experienced this little hiccup. But when you see people at the top admit to vulnerabilities and things that went wrong, then it just normalizes and opens that conversation up for people who like don't have this perfect, glittery, sparkly life, right? Absolutely. And I think the victory lap that I went on, that a lot of my female eventual, you know, founder peers went on was fun and inspiring, but it was also really dangerous that at a certain point, the Forbes 30 under 30 became this like calling card for people. It was like, that's what I remember my former assistant being like, God, the pressure to be on the Forbes 30 under 30. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like 10 years ago, 26 year olds weren't looking at Forbes and they didn't want to be on lists and they didn't care. And so what used to be cool was had nothing to do with that. And now it's like, if I'm sitting on panels, I've made it. And that's like very dangerous because those things can be really distracting and are often not essential to building your career or your business and being in front can help but you should be really strategic about it. And that whole kind of thing, you know, lap that I went on um, as inspiring as it was to a lot of people and as as fun as it was for me, I always try to caveat that now in retrospect with a little bit of a warning that maybe, maybe don't be as so enamored by accolades um, because it can be distracting. And if that becomes your motivation in any way, then Mm -hmm. your eyes are completely off the ball. I know you don't have any regrets about the trajectory and how things went. Do you know what happened? Like how exactly, or what do you think went wrong with the company? Mm -hmm. I think the first nail in the coffin with Nasty Gal was being overvalued. And we've seen this with a lot of companies, especially in 2021, where venture capitalists were pouring tons of dollars into these businesses when some of them had absolutely no revenue. Some of them weren't billion dollar business opportunities. And Nasty Gal was really early e-commerce days. It was before there was a, a playbook. It was before Glossier in a way and Outdoor Voices and all of these direct to consumer brands that could hire executives who actually had experience building, you know, direct to consumer e-com businesses, which like those people didn't even exist when I started Nasty Gal. And it's really hard to build a billion dollar product online, whatever, direct to consumer, consumer product business. And so the expectation when we, you know, when we were valued at $350 million and doing 28 million in revenue, by the way, was that the next time we raised money from investors was that that was at a billion dollar valuation at the company that someone was going to say you're worth a billion dollars, which meant we had to quadru- I mean, quadruple. I don't even know what multiple exponentiate beyond 10x mm-hmm. revenue. 280 million in revenue might have gotten us to a billion dollar valuation. And even then, that's a very dangerous thing to have that kind of a number on your head. So I think we were overvalued, which made it hard for us to fundraise, even when the company was doing over $100 million in revenue. Had someone come in and said, your company's worth $250 million. I want to buy it. My investors wouldn't have been happy because they would have like lost money. They would have, you know, they paid more. This person would have been buying it for less. And that wasn't what they wanted, even though by anyone else's measure, that is like success. That would be incredible. And especially I owned 80% of the company that would have made me richer than Beyonce. I don't know. And so that was like, that was the beginning. And then it was just like a series of like hiring the wrong executives. You know, I, I loved our CEO, but she had not been a CEO before getting executives to align and not try to like politics and power plays and pissing contests and, you know, People, you know, lobbying for weird 
power and it's like I never experienced that before. I I never knew that you had to hold executives accountable. So I hired C level executives that had had careers for longer than I had been alive. And I was like, cool, you're going to diagnose the business. I'm hiring you because you know more than me. I'm not going to micromanage you. That seems like embarrassing. Like why I would not want to be told what to do if I was in your position. You're clearly an expert and you should be grown up enough to get along with these other people and synthesize what needs to be done and bring. But no, actually, people need to be led. They want to be inspired. They need to be held accountable. People 20, 30, whatever, however many years older than you as a young leader, I just had no idea. And I had no example of leadership. So I was as as cute as it is, you know, I was I really try to tell people that before you start a business, like go work for someone. Um, go get experience. Go get paid to get experience. You yes, you can, you know, bump into a lot of things. You can start things on the side, but having some kind of an example of what but being in an organization looks like, what leadership looks like, working for someone who's going to develop you as talent so that you know how to do that when you have your own team is really important as an entrepreneur. In that 2017 time period, did you ever take a break or did it was it straight on to your next venture? Yeah, I never took a break because the momentum of Girl Boss was so huge even when Nasty Gal was falling apart. The book spent 18 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and it sold half a million copies and the Netflix series was coming just months after the whole thing fell apart so I was like awesome, weird, scary, bad time. I'm not going to disappear because Girl Boss is still relevant and so many women were inspired by it. So I started Girl Boss like pretty much right away and through a conference called the Girl Boss Rally and sold 500 tickets in a couple weeks and even though I was, you know, kind of smeared in the press as this failure, not a girl boss, whatever, all the women that I had met through business, every one of them, executives, entrepreneurs, Emily from Glossier, Ty from Outdoor Voices, Kevin Sistrom, the founder of co-founder of Instagram showed up because he's a friend, just like flew down. So like nobody like bailed. I think people think that when you fail or, you know, don't do well with something that your friends are going to think. But they like for me, they all continued showing up and I feel really grateful for that. So I built Girl Boss for another three years. We did a bunch of events, a bunch of conferences in LA and New York. Eventually it was like 1500 women at each of those events. I had Girl Boss Radio, my podcast for five years, which had like 22 million downloads. And it was an amazing run. I sold Girl Boss at the end of 2019. So I guess right before COVID hit and I left during COVID to start something called business class. Um, so I had seen these online educators start these online courses and there's funnels and there's a whole like formula for it. And I'd kind of arrived at that point at the fact that I am not a business model innovator and I don't want to be, and I'm really good at brand and I have a lot of information to share. And I know that I have impact to make with what it is that I know and I have a community, but look, there's this framework that I can use to start an online course. And so people like Marie Forleo, Amy Porterfield, very different kind of vibes and brands from mine. And they get like, they get really cheesy eventually. Like there's a lot of people using these formulas. I decided, all right, I'm going to start something called business class, super basic name. But when you actually look at business class, it's a double entendre kind of pun in that I'm dressed like a Pan Am flight attendant and everything is aviation themed. So each of the modules is called a flight. Each of the lessons is called a leg. <laughs> it's pre-recorded, but there's a module or a flight that drops every week over the course of 10 weeks, but there's only seven. So there are three layovers, which are break, you know, break weeks for catching up. So it's just endless puns. It's really, really fun. Um, so started that uh, in 2020 and built that, just bootstrapped it, put a few hundred grand into it, which could have totally not worked. But again, there's like a bit of a formula figured out the funnel thing and the Facebook ads. And I didn't reinvent much other than the brand and the content. And that's one thing I think is important for entrepreneurs to know is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Business class is successful with a whole bunch of other things that other, you know, other companies do. Like yeah. Business class uses a bunch of other things that online course creators did long before me 
but just in a different way. So you can shift things one degree and have something that feels radically different. And so business class did over a million in profit its first year. So that's what I've been doing late 2020. And during that time, I've been angel investing. So the answer is no, I didn't stop. <laughs> but I was angel investing. You don't seem like the type of person who will ever stop. Like you I don't seem think like so. I just like learning. Yeah, I like learning. I like getting my hands dirty. And as the CEO of a big company, being in the weeds is not something that your executives want you to do. They want you to like keep the trains running on time and make executive decisions, and not be like editing photos. But as an investor or even as a bootstrap, like small business owner with one employee on business class, I can be looking at things and touching things and copywriting. If I had a team of copywriters, they would not be happy if I was copywriting, right? So I keep things small on purpose now because the stuff I really enjoy doing is the stuff that you have to delegate when you have a much larger team, which is, you know, totally relevant with trust fund, which I'm doing now. Yeah. I'm curious with the business class and the you work with so many entrepreneurs and people who want to build their own businesses. What do you think is the fastest way to $100,000 right now? The creator economy is booming. It's just getting bigger. And whether you call the creator economy somebody who's doing what you do or someone who has a small business and is creating promotional reels to share their talents and expertise on Instagram and has like a service-based business. At this point, we can all take, whether it's our humor, our knowledge, you know, our expertise and create info products, for lack of a better word. It's a disgusting word. And there are some really cheesy people out there doing these info product D things that are, you know, not Tony Robbins, but like Tony Robbins adjacent. But there are so many platforms out there that in the same way that eBay gave me a framework to start a business and be like, type in a description, enter, you know, the weight of the item, upload a photo. There's, you know, Kajabi and there's Gumroad and they're all, you know, Patreon, all of these platforms where people can start a podcast, but also monetize their expertise through really repeatable things mm -hmm. like digital products, like downloads. So I have a few downloads and ones it's $49 and it's like 60 plus pages. It's about the creator economy. Um, and so that's a digital product that I sell and I get to sell it over and over again. I don't have to have a bunch of inventory of dresses and stuff. And it really does help people and they love it and it's worth it. And then with online courses, you have these other platforms where, again, you can and also sometimes in a really scrappy way, sit down, think about what it is that, you know, more than anybody else, if there's a gap and if that's something other people want to learn. And again, there's also a formula for whether it's running ads or doing it organically and so many people doing it and talking about it. They're literally selling courses on how to sell courses. There's probably more courses on how to sell courses than there are courses. Like, <laughs> then there are courses on anything else. <laughs> so I think the fastest way to $100,000 right now has something to do with the creator economy and largely in products that are repeatable, lather, rinse, repeat, scalable, digital, super nimble, human capital in light, zero to one or two employees, ideally as many freelancers as possible, and something that not that you set it and forget, but that you get to continue to you know, promote, maybe update mm -hmm. and iterate on rather than creating something new every time you want to sell something because that's a much, often a much slower way to $100,000. What about for people who want to start a business, if you had to give them three tips that they absolutely should follow? Just start as ugly and early as possible. Like, don't put the final product out there. You should be embarrassed by the first thing that you put out into the world and you should iterate. So don't spend a bunch of time planning and navel gazing. It's so sad when I talk to friends and it's like, oh, you're still working on that. It's like, just get something out there. It doesn't have to be perfect and see what people think. Talk to people, talk to users, um, talk to your audience, survey people. And you can do that on Instagram stories. You don't have to actually create a prototype for something. You can have a deck. You can socialize it with people and then get feedback and then iterate and then maybe create the thing. So I'd say like start ugly and don't be attached. Like don't be attached to your original idea. Had I been attached to the stuff I sold on eBay that I liked, I wouldn't have created a brand. You know how much stuff on Nasty Gal I sold that I never wanted to wear that I thought was like super cringe? 
plenty of it because it's what other people <laughs> wanted. And that's what a business is. Right. And I put my own spin on it. And it was enough me to feel like still an expression of me and the spirit of the brand was, but I didn't want everything that we sold. Um, so don't be attached to your first idea and don't be, I mean, just don't be attached to your ideas. There's a, I think a quote that's like, only the madman is certain. It's just kind of like always mm. be in learning mode. And I guess that would be the, the third one, which is just even when things are going right, just know that there's always so much to learn. You should always be looking for you know, holes that are springing loose and you're going to be patching them. And even when you don't see them, even when it seems like everything's going great, you have to keep your eye on the ball because when things are going great, there's still stuff lurking beneath the surface that's not going great. And if you don't know what those things are, when the tide recedes, you're going to see all that murky stuff and it's going to be a shock. So figure out how to build from the bottom up something really beautiful so that as things fluctuate in your business, you know that you've built something really strong and intentional under the hood so that when you open it up, you're not like, oh, I thought this, I thought the oil was changed. Like why <laughs> I drive an electric car, but I think you get it. So congratulations. You announced Trust Fund in January of this year. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that came about. Yeah. So I never had a trust fund. I have to build one for myself and it's a venture fund. It's going to be a $10 million fund. I announced in January in TechCrunch that it was going to be a $5 million fund, but I've decided to take it as far as I can. And I could probably take it further, but it sounds just miserable to be asking for money <laughs> for that long. I would like to just be in the market talking to potential investors and trust fund uh, for as short a period of, as possible. But I did actually raise some money last year for trust fund. I just hadn't really talked about it or told anybody about it. But I went out to my network of like amazing venture capital folks and entrepreneurs who I've known for like a decade and was like, hey, I'm doing this. I've made a bunch of angel investments. So invested my own money, over a million dollars of it into startups. And some of those have done really, really well. I've also been an advisor in some of those startups. And that includes public.com, which is kind of a, it's an investing app, Liquid Death, which is canned water, but now worth $700 million. And I invested when it was worth 50. Eat Sleep, which is a, a mattress that is kind of like a sleep fitness, like measures your sleep and you know, heats and cools the bed while you're in it. Pretty cool. Just a variety of really awesome stuff. So went out to my network and was like, hey, I'm raising a $5 million fund. I would love for you to invest. Here's what I'm thinking. Here are the areas that I want to invest in. And really big hitters came in and were like, awesome. Like, we think you can do a good job at this. And so those people are Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz, Chris Dixon, who's also at Andreessen Horowitz, Andrew Chen and Jeff Jordan, who are also at Andreessen Horowitz, Ev Williams, who co-founded Twitter, Paris Hilton, Rob Hayes, who was one of the early first partners at First Round Capital, just like amazing, amazing. Jason Calacanis, who co-hosts the All In podcast, but also wrote a book about angel investing and is um, a big angel investor. And so went out and did that. And that was very legitimizing to have these names in my deck in my presentation and then to go out more publicly in January and say, I'm raising a fund. So I said, OK, I'm reserving a certain amount of money for people to write checks to invest in the fund and invest alongside me into these amazing startups with checks from two to 20 K. And usually for a fund like mine, the checks are like minimum 100, 250 K. They're much, much bigger, which means that only a certain type of person can invest in startup, can invest in a fund like mine that invests in startups. And I announced that I made a little web flow site. I made a type form application and I got over a thousand applications. It was very overwhelming. I got six and a half million dollars worth of applications. I can't take all of them. So that's really exciting. And I'm investing 200K checks into probably 40 companies over the next few years, not consumer products, not CPG, not fashion, no stuff. I've put enough stuff into landfills over the course of my career. And I also know how hard it is to build a billion dollar consumer product business. They can be great businesses, but venture capital has expectations of businesses that can be really outsized to the footprint or the, you know, what it costs to actually operate that business or the bigger impact that it can make and the more kind of enterprise value it can create that's more competitive 
differentiated than maybe a fashion brand, which is really hard to compete. And so I'm investing in tech enabled businesses across fintech, healthcare, and then anything relating to entrepreneurship. When you're interviewing these founders and considering investing in them, what kind of questions are you asking them or what are you really looking for from a star founder? Yeah. So the questions I ask them are like, what is your background? How did you arrive at this problem? Like, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Who would your competition be? Because everyone has competition. If you say you don't have competition, like you're clueless, like you're competing for other people's time who are listening to other podcasts. I'm competing for to write checks into companies, right? Like my competitive advantage at Trust Fund, I actually really have to have one because hot deals are hard to get into. Um, what is their understanding of the market? Why are they uniquely set up? So what's the founder product fit? What do they know about this problem that they're uniquely set up to solve? Because there are a lot of people who could take a run at it. But if the founder has a unique advantage in building something and a unique kind of perspective on that problem, that's really important. I'm looking for people who are like in my network. I may invest in some folks who send me cold inbound pitches, but I would want to send it to other mm -hmm. really successful investors to socialize for them to be like, actually, this is a really great idea. Maybe we want to invest as well because they see the whole landscape. They're going to see every fintech product and be like, yeah, we saw 10 of those. But I could see one be like, this is so exciting. So I'm really kind of following the leaders a little bit here. I'm not leading. I'm not um, taking board seats. I'm asking them like, you know, what's your plan? What do you want to do with the money? How far do you think it's going to get you? What are you, yeah, what are you investing the money in? What does your team look like? Who else is, an invest, is investing? And then a lot of it is like, you know, can my check size fit within the valuation so I have a certain amount of ownership? Because mm -hmm. if a company is worth $25 million and I write a 200K check, I'll own a lot less of it than if the company's valued at $10 million, then I might own 2%. That would be awesome, right? And then yeah. as the company grows, if I own more, of course, it'll be worth more and yeah. look, you know, be a better performance for the people investing in me. Well, I have to go and say, look, I did a good job. I picked companies at an early stage that actually did grow and kept growing and didn't fizzle out after the first year. Are there like of the companies that you've invested in and then also when you were angel investing those companies too, are there maybe two or three traits that you see all successful founders have in common? Yeah, I mean, I think the most successful founders are really singularly focused on building one thing, on doing it well. And if they do build other things within their organization or start new projects, it's very much complementary and strategically aligned with the first thing that they started building, because it's really easy to get excited about a lot of ideas and do things because you can. I've done it and it's distracting and your team's confused and often you can't even execute on those, those things successfully. So founders who are strategic and really kind of phase and prioritize things in a super thoughtful way and whose eyes are just on the ball. They're in their business all the time. They're not like, yeah, they should take vacations, right? We should have personal lives. But, you know, when you're raising a lot of money from investors, yes, there's a conversation about burnout and work-life balance, but really like you want to be super focused on your business as much as possible. And not everybody's set up to do that and that's okay, but you want to be capable of doing that when you start a company that's not a side hustle. How do you map out your life? Like if we were to look five to 10 years going forward, are you envisioning you're at fund three or like, do you plan that far ahead? What are you thinking is the future for you? Yeah. I mean, in five years, I'll be deploying fund two. I'll have raised fund two. I might be raising fund three because that takes a long time. You're kind of like always raising money, which is like a huge part of the job. It's not just being like, cool company. Here's a check. Let's hang. You know, it's like I have a whole nother group of people that I have to you know, answer to and prove myself to and ask from for money from uh which is interesting and i you know i think the answer is like i just honestly i want to be in the house that i live in i want the life that i have i want to be learning i want to be aging well i <laughs> want to be taking care of myself i want to have a good relationship with my friends and family 
Um, I want to be doing things for the right reasons. And I don't know in terms of like, I don't know if I want kids. So that's like part of the obvious, you know, I want to be married. I want to have a family. I did try both of those things. And now at 38, I'm kind of like, I don't know. I kind of like my life. That seems like a really big shock to the system. So it's like, that's something I, I like noodle on. And, you know, I have time for because I've put things away on ice that you need to have a family. But the jury's still out on that. And it's really weird to be so ambivalent about something that I tried so hard to have and be like, what? Like, I don't, I'm not sure, you know? Yeah. And so I wonder with those things, like if you'll ever feel certainty. Because I know I, I asked my friends who have kids, like, did you ever feel like the time was right? And all of them say no. Like, you never feel like the time is right. Obviously, whether you want to have kids or not is a different question from timing, but it's still yeah. interesting. It's definitely never the right time. Because I used to be like, when I got, get back from a book tour for the paperback, for the, you know, hardcover, for the coffee table book called Nasty Galaxy, or when I'm not going through this really hard time, that's too stressful. I can't do this and have acupuncture and go, you know, to the doctor and deal with this. I can't be throwing up you know, in bathrooms or on broadcast television on a book tour. And then it was just like, um, and I'm so glad I didn't have a kid with the people I was trying to have kids with. So honestly, it's like a super blessing. So I am where I'm supposed to be. And I don't know everything, even with what I want. And I think I'm really lucky to be happy with what I have for now. And for that to be some like philosophical question that people just impress upon you to have an answer for, but you kind of don't always have to have an answer for her. I love how real and genuine and authentic you are. And I, I know that people listening to this are going to be able to see it. And I like this idea of you don't have to have everything figured out. Because I remember when I was 20 years old, I was saying, oh, by the time I'm 25, I'm going to be married and be so happy. And then 25 rolls around and it's like, I am single as you can be. And then at 25, I'm thinking, oh, at 30, I'll be this like amazing lawyer well, at 29, I realized that I hated working at the law firm, so I quit. So at 30, I was like not employed. And, you know, all of these things that you set these expectations for of like what you think, where you think you're supposed to be at that point in your life. And it's just nice to see people being like, hey, I'm I'm happy and I'm still figuring it out and I'm learning and I'm enjoying that. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely the fear of being like, oh, uh, did I get left behind or did I not make decisions that I regret not making and there's a pressure to it. So I'm always like, what am I going to look at back at in 10 years? 48 seems way more of a big deal than like 28 to 38. Like, oh, cute, fun, whatever. But like the next 10 years seem really serious. And so I'm like, yeah, what do I, what do I want to have um, built, I guess? And what do I want to be the meaningful thing in my life beyond my dogs and my work? And yes, my my family, my parents, I don't have siblings, I'm not an aunt, whatever. So that is like actually a real question, but it's <laughs> also not something I feel like you can just kind of bolt on an answer to because time is ticking, you know? Yeah, agreed. We have a closing tradition. The podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about Sophia Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away being able to say, Sophia taught me this? Honestly, I feel like everything I do is just a reflection of wanting to share that it's okay to be a work in progress all the time and that nobody has it figured out. People who guest on podcasts don't have it figured out. People who take ice baths in the morning and have a three-hour morning routine don't have it figured out. People who have kids don't have it figured out. People with big careers don't have it figured out. And we're usually not talking about the stuff that we're kind of feeling our way around the dark in and making mistakes with. And, you know, I think we should all be talking about it more. But if you don't have it figured out, like join the club, you just because you have a microphone in front of your face doesn't mean you have like anything special or any secret sauce that people are always looking for some shortcut to. And it just doesn't exist. Love this. Thank you so much yeah, for doing this. Thanks. This was fun. If you've enjoyed the episode, please take a moment to leave a review. It really helps support what we're doing. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.